I thought you were asking the students. My, my screen got all blurry for a second. I'm here. I'm ready. Okay. Hey, everybody. This is uh, my name is Kevin Brookhauser. I'm an English teacher at York School. I'm here with uh, the York School class of 2016, one of the English sections. Um, one of the projects that we do in conjunction with our study of the ancient Greek tragedy Antigone is we have students research uh, historical and contemporary figures who have committed acts of civil disobedience for a cause that they believe uh, fits their value system. And uh, so students gave presentations on uh, everyone from Thoreau to Martin Luther King. And uh, two of our students did presentations on Julia Butterfly Hill who uh, spent over two years up at 180 feet in a redwood uh, in protest of the logging in the redwoods. And, and Julia will correct me, if, make sure that I have my facts straight there, at least close enough. <laughs> and uh, we just thought we might see if we could contact Julia to come in and speak to our class and talk about that act of civil disobedience. So um, Julia, thank you so much for, for joining our class today. Thank you so much. It's this is it's been a long time since I've done the um, video Skype thing, so it's a little weird but wonderful. <laughs> yeah, well, we'd love to have you here in in the flesh, but uh, this is this is a great uh, great way to be able to handle to get this to work. So yeah. let's see. Let's introduce. Let's bring in Willow and Katie. They are two students who actually researched uh, your work, and they have some uh, questions. Okay. Introduce yourself. Uh, okay, I, I'm Katie. I'm Willow. Um, we were just we compiled a list of questions, and we were just wanted to, uh, if wondering if you could outline like what it was like living in Luna for two years, and what you did during that time. Well, a lot of people have like this image, because I get asked a lot of times, like, weren't you bored up there? Because <laughs> you know? people think that I like sat around in the lotus position meditating, oh, you know, like spent a lot of time like having deep spiritual experiences. And although I certainly did have some deep spiritual experiences, um, my life was actually, it was kind of amazing how busy it got. I mean, my home was on a four by six platform, 18 stories up in a tree. And no tree sit had ever gone through the winter time before my tree sit. So it was not prepared for the winter. So in the beginning, I was just dealing with remodeling my home, <laughs> getting it ready for winter time. And then I was also, um, at the very same time, having to deal with extremely hostile loggers who were literally trying to kill me and take my life. And then shortly around that same time, the worst winter in recorded history of California hit, El Nino of 97, yeah. And um, 97, 98. And so then it was just pure, like, trying to survive. <laughs> And so then about the time that Just Survival was done, then the media storm hit. And I was doing interviews all over the world by phone, by a solar-powered phone. And, um, you know, I would be doing drive time in Germany, so that's like midnight our time in California. And then I'd be doing drive time in California, which is 6 o'clock a.m. So I was sometimes on the phone from like 6 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock in the morning. And it was funny because at one point I had this, earlier on, I had this reporter coming up to do an interview. And he said, you know, what can I bring you, Julia? And I started laughing. And I said, I never thought when I climbed 180 feet up into an ancient redwood I was going to have to ask for this. But could you please bring me a day planner? <laughs> Which was before we now have everything on iPhones and everything, right? You know, when I was in the tree, we still had pagers. <laughs> you know, it was like dinosaur old school. So I needed a day planner to, like with a calendar, to keep up with my interviews and all these different things. So the, the interviewer laughed because he thought I was joking at first. I was like, no, I'm actually serious. I need something to keep up with my life. So it got pretty busy. Um, for fun, I had a, a, a hand-powered radio that was donated, and I could wind it for 30 seconds, and it would play for 30 minutes. And um, so I listened to music because I love music. And I also used it to be able to stay on top of what was happening in the world because whenever we care about any issue in today's world, we have to find a way to make it connect to 
other issues and make it relevant for people who might not think that it's relevant to them. So understanding what was going on in the world was actually really important for the campaign. So um, did that answer your question? <laughs> I kind of forgot the question. Um, I have a question. Uh, what was the main thing that inspired you to become such like a strong activist? <laughs> it's a great question because um, one of the things that I tell people all the time is who we are is exactly who we are meant to be. And I'm going to say that again, just so you can like really, really think about all the times that we think we're supposed to be someone else. Who we are is exactly who we are meant to be. But when we look on TV and when we look in the magazines, that's not what we're being told. We're being told we need to talk here and trim there and buy this latest fashion and buy this latest car and buy this latest perfume. Like it's always about us being only happy if we have something else and if we are someone else. And it's why like reality TV stars now are like the hugest stars in the world because everybody is wanting to be somebody else instead of just really being who we are. And the reason I say that is because <laughs> I've been – in tr like I've been stubborn and getting into trouble since I was about two years old. <laughs> and so how this answers your question is that it was the perfect thing for me to do this tree sit action and to become you know the activist I became because um, when I was growing up I had a really difficult childhood and so for many years I was very self-destructive because I was I was in trouble for being me. I was told that I wasn't right, that I wasn't good enough. And so that made me become very self-destructive. And then luckily, I tell people now, like, I'm still stubborn and getting into trouble. I just learned how to direct it into good causes. <laughs> so that's part of what helped me become the activist I became was I was just like, okay, I can either be self-destructive with my stubbornness and my getting into trouble, or I can try and use it for positive change. And then the other piece that also helped me was I grew up with a traveling preacher for a father. We were extremely poor. And there were five of us that lived in a 31-foot camping trailer. So, you know, a four-by-six-foot platform in a tree was a lot of space to me. Because <laughs> when you have five people living in the 31-foot camping trailer, you know, I was like, woo I got a penthouse up here. <laughs> <laughs> so about all those things, you know, and I tell this story because it's important for all of us to realize we don't need to be someone else. Who we are is exactly who we're meant to be. We might need to change our focus, like I needed to, because I, my focus was self-destructive at first, but uh, we don't need to change ourselves. And that even things about our past that we think might be bad or wrong, there's usually a gift in there that helps us become who we're meant to be, which is what happened for me. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, two year, so two years is like a really long time to stay in a tree. Did you ever, Just a little. <laughs> did you ever doubt yourself uh, on your decision to stay up there for that long? Yes, a lot of the time, you know, I mean, at times when I thought I was going to die, I doubted in myself, at times when I wasn't sure if I was even making a real difference, um, at times where I was just worn out, um, one of the hard things was I had to live in an active logging plan, so I had to watch as ancient forests were destroyed, you know, and I know that we won't ever get them back, we can't grow back ancient forests, we can grow back trees, but we can't grow back ancient forests and ancient trees. And so there were times when I wanted to give up just because my heart was so sad. You know, when we are down here on the ground like I am now and like you are, uh, when we get worried about something or upset about something, we can go shopping, we can go out to eat, we can go to the movies, we can go hang out with friends. There's all these things we can do to distract ourselves when we're upset or uncomfortable. But when I was in the tree, there was none of that. There was no running away from being upset or uncomfortable. I just had to be with it. And there were many times where I did doubt myself and where I did want to come down. Um, what I learned through that, though, is that our mind has limits that our heart can be bigger than. Our mind will stop us. You know, people say, thank you for doing that tree sit, Julia. I never could have done that. And I remind people, well, neither could have I. You know, like on December 10th, 1997, if you told me what was coming, I would have laughed, I would have screamed, and I would have run away. <laughs> There's no way I would have said, okay, sign me up for that. <laughs> so the mind will say something's not possible, but the heart doesn't, when the heart cares enough, whether it's about an animal, a place, a person, anytime we hear of acts of extraordinary people, they're just ordinary people who cared enough about something to do something courageous and big. And um, so that's one of the great lessons I got from, from that experience is that 
when my mind says no, sometimes it's telling me no for a good reason and I need to pay attention to it. But beyond just listening to our minds, we need to listen to our heart and ask ourselves, what does my heart say? Because if I hadn't have listened to my heart, there's no way I would have lasted over two years. Um, so you mentioned before that the loggers were very vicious trying to get you to come down. Um, I was wondering if they ever tried to stop the people who were coming in and bringing you supplies. Yes, they did. They um, put security around me with ropes and floodlights, and they cut off my supplies for um, it's either eight or ten days. Ten days. Um, and on day ten, we actually were, or maybe it was day eight. I forget. It was eight or ten days. Um, we were able to get a resupply. In. Anyway, we. I was. I'm, I'm okay. Like, I've actually gone for 42 days without food or juice or anything, lived completely on water um, in, a, in a protest sense, the Luna Tree set, but I had done similar things around before that. So I was not worried about running out of food for a while because, you know, I mean, we're so privileged in this country. Even the most poorest among us are some of the richest in the world. So it's like we we survive on so much more than many people all over the world survive on. So I'm like, well, if I run out of food for a while, I'll be fine. I mean, it's not great, but I'll be fine. Um, but the concern was I was running out of battery power for the phone because it was foggy and rainy, and I had a solar panel that would charge the battery, but when it's all fog and rain, there's no sun, so the battery starts to run out. And um, so we were a little concerned because while I was under security, they were being really mean and really brutal. They were actually blowing air horns, really, really, really loud horns all night and all day so I couldn't sleep either. So not only did I run out of food, I also was on sleep deprivation for eight days or nine days, something like that. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's just really loud. Like super, super, super loud. And they do it like every 10 or 15 minutes throughout the entire day and night so that I couldn't sleep. Um, so they were trying you know, to do all that, and we were concerned about the, the battery and the phone the most, and we planned this action with my last little bit of battery left, and we had, because I had a, a pager, back when we still had pagers, uh, we set up a code that they would page me, and then I would know they were coming up the mountain, another page for when they were close by, and another page to drop the line. And we actually pulled off not only one, but two resupplies, even with security guards. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, then they, two days later they ended up giving up because the worst storms in history were beginning to hit and they were like screw this this girl might be crazy enough to die out here but not us we're going home uh, so that ended the security siege oh, okay. uh, so tree sitting is a violation of property rights and you were asked to leave Luna frequently during your stay why were you not arrested upon finally leaving Luna well, part of the agreement I made with the company was that they would not, never, ever, into perpetuity, ever try to charge me with any charge, um, because I, you know, I, I, I was fine with getting ar arrested if that's what I needed to do. But in the final negotiations, where they agreed to protect the tree and the, the grove around it, and I agreed to come down, part of the negotiation was that. Um, themselves and anyone they did business with could never try and sue me for loss of business or for property right obstruction or for any of that thing. So that's why I was able to come down without being arrested. I've been arrested uh, quite a few times since doing other actions, but that one, you know, I said, if you want me to come down, you can't throw me in jail. <laughs> I've been on a four by six for two years. I'm not going from here to a jail cell unless I absolutely have to. <laughs> um, so... You're most famous for the tree sit and Luna, but uh, you've also done various other acts of c civil disobedience. Um, can you tell us about like protesting the pipeline in Ecuador and getting arrested in Ecuador? <laughs> yeah, that one was, woo! Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness of some of the lessons I learned in Luna because they became, they came in very handy during that time because, um, Number one, I, I, you know, I speak maybe 15 words of Spanish, and so I'm in a country that speaks, very few people speak English fluently, and um, <clears throat> the reason I went down there was because some friends of mine told me that they had been down there working in the Amazon, and they had met 
some young people who had been trained to do tree sits and they were up doing tree sits around where this pipeline was going to go through trying to slow down the process and <clears throat> someone had brought them a copy of my book The Legacy of Luna but it was in English and so and they couldn't read it unless someone would come through who was bilingual and could read it to them so they were telling me about how they were having sorry how they were having um, people read them my book in the tree and that they really wanted me to come and so of course I was like okay I gotta go to that you know I can't tell them because I said nope sorry <laughs> let's see indigenous people forest animals irreplaceable places on earth yeah and they're reading my book in the tree yeah I guess, guess I better go <laughs> so I went and um, I was there for two weeks documenting the pipeline and the tragedy of what's happening. It's really, really heartbreaking. And not only the destruction to nature, but even for people who think nature doesn't matter, which to me seems crazy because we can't survive without it. But even for people who think that nature is just for, you know, hippie tree huggers, there are all these communities that I documented that have cancer that never in their history have ever had cancer before because they have lived in they've lived in a pristine environment and now there's oil spills happening every day into their rivers into their streams that they bathe and drink in children covered in sores because the only thing they have to cool down in is their stream and the stream is so polluted and so they go into the stream to cool down and to wash and then they now are covered in sores so it was really heartbreaking and devastating and <clears throat> about four days into the trip we had a meeting out in the jungle with representatives from 13 different tribes four different Ecuadorian activist groups and two American activist groups and one of the young guys who'd been doing a tree sit who'd been arrested uh, it's her, his turn to talk and he starts talking and he's looking at me and I could tell he was like seeing how far I would go you know he just had that look in his eye let's see let's see what this girl can really do kind of thing you know even though I didn't understand I could see it and so sure enough the translator told me he he said well you know it'd be really great for us if you get arrested because when we get arrested sometimes we get disappeared which is true. I mean he had already been arrested once he didn't want to get arrested again because it was possible his family would never see him again because the way they stop activists in countries like that is they not only throw them in prison, they make them disappear and you never hear from them again. So I looked him straight in the eyes and I said, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't willing to be arrested. And then every once I got translated, he started laughing and I started cheering. Woo! So then they spent like the next two weeks trying to get me arrested. And it didn't happen until what was supposed to be my last day in Ecuador. <laughs> and we had gotten... Um, Occidental Oil Petroleum Company, which is the main consortium of all these different companies that are drilling there, to agree to a meeting with myself, a translator, and four other representatives, and five other representatives, excuse me. And when we get, but we've also planned this big action. So people came from their villages in the middle of the jungle. They like took canoes to a motorboat, to a bus, to a train to get to where this action was to stay like they were traveling for five days to get there and there were hundreds of us out there <clears throat> blockading in the street and creating a scene and when we did of course then the Occidental Oil Petroleum headquarters they freaked out and then they said they would only meet with me they wouldn't meet with anybody else and I said that is so disrespectful there's no way in the world I would meet with you without representatives from the people whose lives are being affected by this like there's no way so we negotiated back and forth, back and forth, and they kept saying, no, I'm just going to meet with you. And I said, well, you just need to understand that if you don't keep your agreement with us, which was to meet with seven people, we're going to shut your offices down. And um, they said, no, you're not, and we're not going to meet with seven. We'll just meet with you. And we said, okay, we're shutting you down. And we did. So we shut them down for four and a half hours. We found out later on we cost them about four and a half million dollars of business in four and a half hours, um, which they weren't very happy about. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the military police showed up and that's when it got dangerous because they uh, they gave no warning that they were going to begin arresting they just began arresting and they were doing it brutally and I ended up getting arrested when they picked a 16 year old boy up off the ground we were all just locked arms on the ground and uh, he had long hair and they literally lifted him off the ground by his hair they yanked him all the way up from a sitting position by his hair and then put him in a chokehold and so I jumped in and was saying, peaceful, peaceful, pacifico, pacifico, no, no, peaceful. And that's when I got arrested. And then um, the crazy thing was that I got thrown first in a closet in a prison. So I, I knew I was in a closet. There was no light. But I knew I was in a closet because I felt around in the dark and there was a mop in a bucket in a broom. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, I'm in a closet in a prison. 
in Ecuador. <laughs> I don't know how long I'm going to be in this closet. I don't know what they're going to do to me when I get out of this closet. I don't know if I'm going to make it out of this closet. And I don't speak Spanish and they don't speak English. Wow, this is going to be interesting. And uh, that just began the journey that was one thing after another. They held what is pretty much a secret tribunal for me. They refused me the right to go to trial. They put me in a room with a guy who was the judge and the jury all on his own. They had a typewriter that they typed something out on, and they said, you're guilty, you have to leave. And I said, okay. And um, <clears throat> I said, you know, my commitment had been to stay with the, if I, I had told the Ecuadorians that if any Ecuadorian got arrested, I would go through the same process as them. So I was planning on going through trial, I was planning on going to jail with them, everything. But uh, the president of Ecuador at that time had issued a mandate against me saying, if I got caught, I had to be evicted from the country. So I was like the president of the country. <laughs> like I just sat in a tree, and the president of the country's tripping on me, man. This is amazing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so they um, they tried me. They refused me trial. They put me in a cell. They snuck me out of the cell in the middle of the night. They took me to another building in the city. I don't even know where. Um, and then they're supposed to send you back to your country of origin when they deport you, but they sent me to Mexico. <laughs> they were like, the next plane out is Mexico and you're on it. And they were trying so fast to get me to the airport to try and keep the media from finding me that they actually wrecked the truck with me in the truck on the way to the to the, um, to the airport. And I hyperextended my wrist and my thumb and luckily I didn't smash my head because I have already damage from a previous wreck and if I hit my head again it could be very serious. So I ended up hurting my hand really badly by protecting my head from going through a metal grate. Um, so that was, that's a, that's actually an abbreviated version of my Ecuador experience. <laughs> um, can you also tell us a little bit about, um, when you, in, when you were, worked with, uh, tax redirection and you refused to pay taxes and gave your money to charity instead? Yes, yeah, that's actually a form of my everyday activism because once you start something like that, it doesn't just all of a sudden stop. So what happened was many years ago, I found someone approached me with this ad in a magazine and said, Julia, why did you agree to sell this product? Like, that just doesn't seem like you. And I said, what are you talking about? And they showed me this ad, and it was an ad of a girl who looks very much like me, sitting up on a platform in a redwood forest with a lot of the same things that I had on my platform that were in media all over the world. And then the clincher was she had a chalkboard, and it said day 538. And I was in the tree for 738 days. And I was like, oh, my God, this is awful. I was so mad because here, not only me, but my team and all these people who had sacrificed so much, I'd, I'd almost lost my life for this cause, and now they were going to steal my story to sell a, a, a wireless device? I was like, this is crazy. But at first I didn't know I could do anything about it, and then I ended up finding out that I could, and I got a pro bono law firm to agree, a law firm, excuse me, to agree to represent me pro bono, because I told them I'd be giving all the money away, because I felt that... Um, when they wronged me, they wronged the movement. They were basically saying it's okay to steal from the people who are trying to make our world a better place in order to sell more crap, which is what's making our world worse. It was like it goes against everything I believe in. So I said, well, I'm just going to, you know, I would never have the opportunity to be a donor because I don't earn enough as an activist. So this will give me a chance to be a donor. It'll be so much fun. I can give to all these causes I believe in. So let's go for it. And so we did. But about six months before settling, I found out uh, that even with the best, ta best tax attorneys and tax lawyers and everything, that the IRS still wanted uh, about 33% of the settlement, including in-kind. So part of the settlement included um, in-kind services that didn't pay me money, but they wanted a percentage of the value of that as well. And so that was, at that time, $175,000. And this was right when we were under Bush Jr., um, heading into Iraq and I just I was in Louisiana protesting I like to go to places that are unusual because a lot of you know more well-known people go to like all the regular places and the rest of the country gets left <laughs> by themselves so I try as much as I can to go to the parts of the country in the world that other people aren't going to 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 bring support so I'm in this little town in Louisiana protesting, and there's like maybe a thousand of us, and these guys on Harleys were running their Harleys all the way up to us. I have 
motorcycle marks on a pair of pants from where they ran the tire all the way into my pants. And the police were there and didn't even stop them. There were stu um, university students throwing beer bottles at us and bricks at us. Like, it was crazy. And I'm like, we're just here asking for peace. How can you, like, boo peace, you know? <laughs> like, how can you throw bottles at peace? I'm like, come on. You know, it's like, wow, what is our world coming to? And then um, I came back out to California, and I was in San Francisco, part of the big movement that shut down the financial district, and I helped shut down the federal building, and did all this craziness. And it was so much fun and, and invigorating to be a part of something I believed in. But as I was in that process, I was like, but how many of us just go back to our lives and feed this animal that we then tell to stop consuming our world? Like, we feed this beast and then say stop. It's like, well, how do we think we're going to stop it if we keep giving it the power by feeding it all this money? And so I knew I could not at that time give $175,000 because I knew, and the minute I go there, it always makes me cry, but I knew that I was going to be seeing pictures like many of us did of innocent people blown into bits. And, you know, dads holding their kids and moms holding their kids and their loved ones. And I just was like, I know what's coming. Innocent people are literally going to be blown up. And if I give that money right now, I will be paying for that picture I'm going to see that's going to break my heart and still does to this day, obviously. And I just said, I can't do it. I cannot right now in good conscience give this money. So I wrote a big long letter to the IRS and I said, I'm actually for, I'm not like one of those people who's against taxes. I actually love when we do things together. Like if we pool our money together and used it for good, imagine what our world would be like right now. <laughs> you know, it would be the opposite of what it is right now because right now we pull our money and do a bunch of bad stuff with it. So imagine if we just flipped the coin and used all that money to do good, how good it would be in this world. So I wrote that in the letter. I'm like, I'm not against paying taxes. It just goes against every moral fiber of my being to pay for things that will cause violence and murder and death and... I can't do it. I'm just, it's against my values. It's against my being. And I said, so I'm going to pay my taxes. I'm just going to pay them where they belong because you refuse to do so. And once you choose to start using our taxes to make the world a better place, I'm happy to start paying my taxes again. <laughs> but now with penalties and fees and interest, they say I owe over oh, nearly $500,000 at this point. And I can't own anything or they'll take it. I can't have any long-term contracts, so they'll take the money from that. So it actually is a part of my everyday activism. I have to find creative ways to pay my bills and to survive and to do what I want to do and what I believe in in the world. And uh, it's not been an easy choice, but it's one that I am so glad I made because, you know, of course, I'm not completely free of the violence that happens in the world. Every time I get in a car, I participate. Anytime I you know, get food that didn't come from my backyard, I participate. So I'm not trying to say I'm perfect and that I'm free of the violence that's happening in the world. But anywhere I can, I try to reduce the harm that I cause and try to do as much good as I can. And I, as challenging as that choice has been, it's one that I'm really, really proud of. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I made that choice, even though there's some days where I'm like, God, crap, now what am I going to do? Because it, it makes living interesting. <laughs> Uh, so civil disobedience is kind of an extreme form of protest. So as students, how do you suggest, um, if we feel something is wrong, how do you suggest that we try and like, like protest that or try and express that feeling? Well, they, I mean, there's, if you think of it like building a house, right? So um, direct action, civil disobedience, we see that happening only when all other systems have failed. People don't go and put their lives on the line. They don't risk their freedom. They don't risk their homes. They don't risk their lives as the first step, right? Like that's When that happens, it's because all other systems are failing. Governments are failing in their responsibility to uphold and protect the public trust. Corporations are failing in their responsibility to provide goods and services that help our world instead of hurt it. And consumers are failing in their responsibility to pay attention to what they buy and who and what is impacted as a result of that choice. And that's when we see direct action happening. But if you think of it like a house, well, then that means when you build a house, the first thing you always want to do when you're building a house is make sure you do the foundation really, really well, <laughs> right? Like I always tell people if you're building a house, and you sketch it all out and you find out that you're like $30,000 over budget, the one place you're not going to ask them to scrimp is the guys who build the foundation. <laughs> you know, you're going to change some door handles, some light fixtures. You might get rid of one window, but you're not going to say, hey, can you make that foundation a little cheaper? You know, because you know the house is going to crumble. So 
it's the same thing when we look at our lives. Like at first, let's look at the fountain. Any issue that you care about, whatever it is, whatever it is that's moving your heart in this moment, whether it's animals or trees or how we treat our children or our elderly or war, whatever it is, food, um, whatever the issue is, first look at the foundation, which means look in your own life and look at where are you living in a way that models the solution and the answer and where, how might you be living in a way that's hurting it? Because, you know, I've, I take that lens to myself every single day. I'm constantly asking myself, is there a way that I could make this choice a little better, a little kinder? Again, there's no perfect choice, but can I, can I make a choice that's more in integrity with my beliefs? And integrity is not about right or wrong, good or bad, I'm better than your, you, that kind of thing. Integrity shares the same root word as integral. It just means, is it connected or is it not? So we look first in our daily life and say, what do I care about in the world and how is my life connected to what I care about or how is it disconnected? And where it's disconnected, is there a way to maybe bring it a little closer, even if it can't be completely connected? Is there a way to make it a little closer? And then we go from there to our community. So for you, would be your next step of community would be your school. Is there a way to bring more integrity in in your school, whatever that issue is? It might just be education and you know letting people know about the issue. It might be, um, for me, it's like, it's very important to be creative too because there's so much going wrong in the world that we all are kind of like up to here. <laughs> if I hear one more ter person telling me what I need to change, I'm going to be like, ah! So we have to make it interesting. We have to make it creative. You know, we have to make it fun when we can. The issues aren't fun or funny, but if we can bring fun and creativity and solutions, not just problems, we're more likely to get other people to want to participate with whatever it is we care about. And then from there, we can look at a global perspective. Is there a way to build a partnership, maybe with a student in another part of the world or an organization in another part of the world? And then the ultimate thing to remember is the greatest changes in history, and as I always say, in history, that have ever happened, have only happened when people were willing to put their bodies where their beliefs are. You know, I remind people that as a woman, like, I like to wear pants. It makes tr climbing trees easier. <laughs> but, you know... In certain parts of the world, women still can't wear pants. And here, we weren't always allowed to wear pants, right? It's, and it wasn't like all of a sudden some benevolent white dude got a light bulb going above his head and said, you know, women should be allowed to dress how they want. Like, women actually fought for our right to be self-determined in what we wear. Women went to prison for that. Like, you think about it. Like, if women went to prison for wi us women today, we never even got to meet them. For us women today to have the right to be self-determined with what we wear. And they had to go to prison for that. So we have to really recognize, because we think about things like voting and, and um, uh, slavery and these kind of issues, but so many simple things that we took for granted, people risk their lives for those, those privileges now. And so <clears throat> if something calls deeply enough upon our heart, we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to put my body where my beliefs are? And for me, sometimes the answer is no. Like, there's certain times where I've had the opportunity since coming out from Luna where I feel like strategically maybe it's not the best choice for me at that time. But there have been other times, like in Ecuador and in Texas and other times, where I'm like, yes, now is the right time, and so I do that. Um, so we just have time for one more question. And just to end, um, what do you want us to remember from this interview and when we go off into our lives? Mm. <clears throat> well, I, I hope that, I mean, number one, I hope that you'll remember whatever's most important to you. And I know that sounds kind of like a pat answer and like, oh, what does that mean? But I, like, I really mean that because we're all different and that's a good thing. Like anywhere in nature that it's a monoculture, it's a dying system. Like that's part of what's happening to our food. As we've killed off diversity in our food and created monocultures, what's happening? Pesticides are now being used because we have too many pests, which is causing more problems. Fires, infestations, like... If you, if you go to a lake and the water doesn't have a way to go in and out, there's no life in the lake. Like, you know, diversity and energy movement, all these things is nature's wisdom saying that's important. And so if diversity and energy moving is important in nature, then it's important for human nature too. And so what's going to, you know, what one of you is going to have appreciated from our conversation today is going to be different than for somebody else. But I hope that whatever it is that made you go, yeah, that's good, or hmm, like anything that made you come alive, that made your head go, wow, I never thought about it that way. Like whatever that is, that, that will stick with you because you're going to go back out into the craziness of life and school and tests and grades and then the bombardment from the TVs and the magazines. Like all that stuff's going to hit you and it's so easy to forget those moments when we go, oh wow. 
So whatever it is today that had you go, oh wow, I hope that sticks with you. And then I also hope that, I mean the reason why I say yes to doing events and if I could have made it to you all in person I would have today, unfortunately I couldn't, but um, <clears throat> I I so much want each and every one of us to realize that we are all creating our world together. And it literally is every moment of every day, every choice. Because no choice happens in a vacuum, it's actually scientifically impossible to make no difference. <laughs> it's scientifically impossible to have no impact. Sorry! You know? <laughs> <laughs> People are all the time telling us, do you really think one person can make the difference? Or thank you for showing us that one person can make the difference. And I'm like, no, every time we make a choice, it makes a difference. And we got to really get that. We need to get that in our hearts. We need to get that in our minds. We need to feel what that feels like in our body to really get that every time we make a choice, we change the world. The problem for many of us in privileged society like we are in is we're so disconnected from the thread of our choice of where that choice started from and where it ends up that we don't realize how powerful we are and so I really my my hope and my prayer is that underneath whatever made you go hmm wow interesting but also you realize that every time you make a choice you're changing the world every single time and we are the ones in control of our choices we can't control the rest of the world as much as I wish I could, you know, I'm pretty sure that if I ran the world, it'd be perfect, but, you know, I can't. So uh, all I can do is look at my own life and try to make choices that will make the world a better place. And the other thing I'd also like to say is that um, sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. And if you're attached to the outcome when you try to do something, you're going to be miserable and sad and become cynical and angry, and that's not going to make your life any better, and it's not going to make the world any better. So everything I do, regardless of if I win or lose, I'm doing it because I love the world, I love the planet, and I want my life to have some way been in service to that, win or lose. And I hope that whatever you all choose to do moving forward with your lives, that you don't get attached to the outcomes, that you just find the joy on the journey because who knows where it's going to lead and what's going to happen um, but you'll be a lot happier doing the work if, if it's attached to the outcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Those were great questions. Well, let me, let me just conclude this by saying, um, you know, one of the things you mentioned, diversity, and now there's a lot of diversity of beliefs, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to get to teach in a class that's, uh, that's quite diverse in, in a lot of different areas, and, uh, you know, there, we've got a lot of diverse political opinions in this classroom, and, and while, while many of us uh, are aligned with, what, with the work that you're doing, I think all of us can agree that we highly admire the courage you demonstrate to, to put your beliefs on the line in a, in a very real way and, and I'm inspired myself and I'm sure the class is too. Thank you so much and thank you, uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Bye Julia. Bye.